believe it's it's a pleasure to invite uh, jesco hutenheim uh, to give the talk today so he'll be talking about techniques from projective geometry for orbit closures yeah jesco the floor is yours Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm, as I said before, I'm super happy to be here. I'm very excited. Uh, I don't have an introductory slide. Um, there's not too much to say. I basically will be presenting what I did in my PhD thesis. And well, that's the reason for being here. I wrote a thesis about techniques for projective geometry and how to apply them to uh, orbit closures in GCT. Uh, the outline will be this. So first I'll spend a little time on introduction and notation and let me give me just a second to start my timer so I have a vague impression of where I am. Okay, so I'll spend a little time on introduction and notation just so we're on the same page and then I will spend most of my time, I think, speaking about the rational orbit map, which is sort of like the the object that we want to study, yeah, the device that we are most interested in properties that are uh, derived from it. And in I, I have dedicated like one specific thing that is derived from the study of this map or uh, is the study of maximal linear subspace. If you don't know what it is, don't worry, we'll talk about it. Um, and I dedicated a special section to this because I think it is of um, particular importance and also of particular interest. And I will finish with just uh, musing about strategy and some reading suggestions if you want to get into this and if you like maybe want to pursue this. All right, so introduction and notation. Um, the scenario that we will be in all of this time is usually that we have a finite dimensional complex vector space W and we have a polynomial in CW, which you can think of like in various ways, of course, you can think of it as a function from W to C or you can think of it as a polynomial in variables x1 up to xn, which are the coordinates of your, of your vector space. And then we also are usually interested in some kind of linear transformation, which is, I mean, I wrote A in GLW, but we will also look at just non-invertible linear transformation, uh, if transformations. And um, these linear transformations, they act on polynomials, and the way they act on them is like, in my opinion, and in my notation, as a right action, because they, they act on these polynomials by precomposition. So if you have like your, your space W, uh, and down here you have C, then P, you can think of P as a, as a map, just mapping from W to C. And A is clearly a map that maps from W to W. And you can move P around by precomposing it with A into a new polynomial map, which is P composed with A. And so my notation for the for the group action is just P little circle A. It's not a dot P, which you might have seen before, because I am personally am convinced that the right way to do it is to consider it as a as a right action. Um, and the objects that we're interested in are the orbit and its boundary. I mean, I'll, I'll get into a few more concrete examples in a minute, but like, give me a moment to, to spend time on the, on the abstract. So GLW in this way, as outlined in the lower left, acts on CW, of course, this is the space of all polynomials, but in particular, it also acts on the space of homogeneous, like if you restrict to a specific homogeneous degree, which is to say you like, you restrict your polynomials to those where every monomial has the same degree d. And uh, because the action is linear, it does map homogeneous polynomials to homogeneous polynomials. What I will denote by omega p is then simply, I pick a polynomial and I compose it with the entire uh, general linear group on W, which gives you a set. Of course, there's a bunch of polynomials. So this is, a, this is just P composed with A for every A in GLW. And you can also, you can play the same game just with non-invertible linear maps, of, of course. So you can, you can also consider this set, which is P composed with the entire endomorphism set. And what, like now, now this is, this is the, the orbit of the polynomial. And what you can do with the orbit is you can consider its closure. I'm pretty sure you, I hope you've heard before that this closure is uh, both the Zariski and the Euclidean closure of this set inside the space uh, of polynomials. 
And if you didn't, then now you know. And taking the closure and removing like the, I will say, quote unquote, the interior without having, uh, without making any topological statement, <laughs> then you get something that I define to be the boundary. And um, this boundary is a, is a hypersurface inside this closed set. And it's very interesting. I will, I will, I will get to why I'm so interested in it in, it, in a minute. But first, I'd like to make a few, uh, I'll lay out a few remarks and and what the goal is. So I would like to understand this boundary, and the reason is essentially because I think this is on a future slide. But the interior, like th this orbit, is essentially boring. It's just a bunch of copies of P with in different coordinates. I've, I've changed nothing about the nature of the polynomial P. I'm just expressing it in different coordinates. Every, ch every change inside here is by definition an invertible one. So all I'm changing is basically, I could, instead of just moving P, I could also just change my frame of reference and it would be the same. But the things in the boundary, they are more interesting in a sense because they are truly distinct from P. Now, some of them, you may say, are not that interesting at all because they just come from composing with a with an in, with a non-invertible uh, linear map. So, like you could just uh, set a variable to zero or set a variable to a linear combination of two others, and that would give you something in the boundary. And those are not particularly interesting. But in general, composing P with all of endo like with the entire endomorphism set does not give you. Um, the orbit closure. There's a few things in there that really require you to like to approximate that, that you can't get without actually approximating. So yeah, something is missing. And um, I want to show you what is missing because I think it's because I spent <clears throat> a lot of time for my PhD defense making this graphic and I want to reuse it. <laughs> so <laughs> assume like, let's look at two polynomials which are uh, well suited for this presentation. One is this cubic and the other is this cubic. So x times y squared minus e cubed and y times yz minus x squared. And then there's also this easily memorable uh, linear transformation with one parameter epsilon with which you can pre-compose p. So p is a polynomial in three variables and you can think of a epsilon, which is a three by three matrix as a linear map from C3 to C3. And of course I can pre-compose p with a epsilon and what I get is Q, so this one, I mean, you have to do the computation, but I promise this is true. You get Q minus epsilon cubed X cubed. Now Q, there's a, there's a couple of reasons why Q is actually not in the endomorphism orbit of P. Um, and essentially that's because it's an, like I will, I'm not, it's an entirely different polynomial. So this one, P is irreducible and Q factors as a line and a, and a um, quadric, I think. Man, Latin terms. Uh, <clears throat> and I will show you like what they look like. What you have here right now is epsilon equal to one. So this is essentially P. It's a, it, there's a little transformation applied to it, but no, uh, sorry, this is, um, yes, this is essentially P. And this one is essentially Q. So this is epsilon equals to zero. So this is when you, when if you if you were if you were allowed to set like you're allowed to set epsilon to zero over here, but you are not you're not allowed uh, to do it over here. Um, but I will show you how the approximation uh, works because I think this is rather beautiful. So uh, like when you when you look at the two things like this and this it's not immediately or it wasn't immediately clear to me how one would turn into the other but the curve sort of bends backwards onto itself and then approximates this beautiful thing and this is an example of a polynomial that is in the and, and, i mean it's just a it's just some visual eye candy we won't need this for the rest of the talk i just wanted to give a one example of a polynomial that is in this orbit closure but not in the endomorphism orbit Okay, now uh, we have, um, this is the entire scenario. So as I said before, we always have this W, which is a finite dimensional vector space, 
we will be usually looking at homogeneous polynomials. We'll restrict to homogeneous polynomials, which can also be understood as a finite dimensional vector space, because this capital N is the number of, um, of monomials of degree D in N variables. Then you have the orbit, which I defined before. It's just P composed with GLW. You have the closure and you have the boundary. Now, the example that I was probably most interested in in my thesis was the case where W is a space of matrices itself and P is the D times D determinant. And in this case, I'm just pointing out that in this case, the endomorphism set of W is actually a set of linear maps that map matrices to matrices. This can be very confusing in practice. Um, and in this uh, specific example, the boundary is not well understood. Now, and I, I, I probably should have put this note on the slide before. My, my, at this point, the, the, I, I want to explain why like, I already said it, but I think the boundary is the interesting part because it can contain these things that are fundamentally different from what we started with. Like, and I take P and I do linear transformations. It is essentially just P in disguise. But the things in the boundary, they can be, well, they, can, they could be something surprising. And that that's what makes it interesting to me. Now, my modest contribution <laughs> to this is that I, I, I can't tell you that the boundary of the orbit of the three by three determined polynomial is itself a union of two orbit closures itself. So you can think of this hypersurface as being a union of two irreducible hypersurfaces, which, um, well, at the time that I wrote it was more than we knew before. Um, I was given to understand by uh, Christian that we do not, we don't want to care about the determined polynomial that much anymore. There's a few other polynomials that are, um, that are equally interesting or even better suited for GCT. But um, luckily, all the, like, I'll work with this example, but all the things I did don't like, they're not limited to the determined polynomial in the nature of the technique. So we will be, we will be treating this in the abstract and return to the example just to have some example uh, most of the time. All right, so much for setup. Now we can start talking about what I actually did, which is study the rational orbit map. And first we probably want to know what this is. Um, the rational orbit map will be something that comes out of the transition from affine cones to projective space. Everything in this scenario that I've presented so far like plays in the realm of affine cones. We'll soon see that. And affine cones are tightly connected to projective space and geometers really love projective space. So uh, here's the problem. Um, as I said before, we're always looking at a polynomial P in like a polynomial ring over some finite dimensional space W. And I'm defining a map for you. I call it omega uh, check P. And so whenever you see a letter with a tiny thing on top of it, it usually means that this is not the object I want to look at because sometime in the future, I want to remove this check and I will want to look at omega P, which will be the rational orbit map, but I haven't defined it yet because there will be, we, we have some trouble, some problems to overcome before we do that. So, but let's define omega check P. That is something we can easily define. It's a map that goes from the space of endomorphisms into this orbit closure. And it's defined simply by mapping a map <laughs> to like mapping a linear map, which you may think of as a matrix, like it's a, if you want, and we map that to the precomposition with P. So it's the, it's the orbit action. It puts a, a, a mover to like to the, to what it moves the polynomial to. And now, now this sentence might need some thinking about. So we, I, I say we usually view uh, omega P bar through this morphism, but it is not surjective. So this is, what I mean by this is how do you think about things in the orbit or the orbit closure. Me personally, I think of these objects as this. They're always P precomposed with something. That is the, that's the definition of the object. That is, that is how I view this object. It's my, it's my only intuitive way to perceive this object. 
but like by thinking of, okay, so I start with all of these and then, yeah, then I have approximations of these, but the objects I look at are always these. And the big problem in my opinion is that, well, the map is not subjective, so we're not seeing everything. We, we can't see everything we wanna see, but this is our, like, it's our, it's our only lens, but it's not a very good one. Um, so there is a good, uh, a famous and fantastic proposition from algebraic geometry, which is that when you have um, a projective morphism, which uh, like, like, let's call it gamma, and it goes from some variety gamma to some other variety Y. And um, by projective morphism here, I just mean that gamma is a projective variety. Then whenever you have a subvariety Z and gamma, the image gamma of Z is again a subvariety in the in the codomain. This is fantastic. Uh, normal, like usual or affine uh, morphisms in algebraic geometry do not have this property. You can't take something closed and and when you map it, it will it will not. So when you map something that is closed, the, the image doesn't necessarily uh, have the same property. Is this is no longer it, it can it can happen that it's no longer closed, which um, is the case up here actually, right? Because when you the entire endomorphism uh, space is closed, but the image is not, otherwise it would be subjective. And um, right, so the main idea is if only omega check P was projective, that would be so nice because then it would also be surjective. Uh, the reason for that is simply um, it, the image of omega P is dense. It's, a, it's almost everything. It's everything but a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. And if you have a map that is closed and the image is dense, then it has to be surjective. It has to hit everything because it, it just can't be, the image can't be dense without, without being everything because the map is closed. So the main idea is let's make this thing projective. Obviously this will be, uh, it, won't, it won't be that simple, but that's, that's the idea. Uh, so let's see, I will, I'll introduce some, some musings that help us do this. Um, let's start again with the polynomial P and this time it's homogeneous so that this actually works. And we pick some A, some endomorphism A. And then we also pick some Lambda, which is just a complex number. And when you then first scale the matrix by Lambda and you apply this scaled matrix to the polynomial, what you will get is the same as if you had applied the matrix to the polynomial and scaled the whole thing by lambda to the D. And that's because um, P is homogeneous of degree D. So you can think of A as, think of a simple linear transformation first, maybe so it's a diagonal matrix. All it does is, is scales every variable. Now I scale every variable, not in the way that A did, but I, I scale every variable by an additional lambda. So in every monomial, I have D variables. What do I do? I scale it by an additional lambda to the D. Uh, I won't go deeper into the proof of this, but the point, like the, the point of this is omega check P maps lines to lines. So if you don't consider just A, but you consider the entire line through A, then you can see here that any point on this line will be mapped to a point on the line through omega check P of A. So we're mapping lines to lines. And um, it, like it actually also, it already follows from this uh, that uh, the, the orbit uh, closure is an affine cone. So for every point you have in the orbit. So first of all, this proves it immediately for the orbit. So for every point you have in the orbit, um, you, you also get the entire line through that point. And then through some topology hand waving, you easily get that you also like that, that the closure is also an affine cone. So what you have over there, like the, the, the object that we're interested in, well, it's an affine cone and affine cones are very, uh, are closely connected to uh, projective varieties because what you, what, what do you do to get, to go from an affine cone to a projective variety? You just say, okay, my points are now these lines done. So projective space is just the space of lines. And this is why this, okay, so in general, we are in a projective situation. Now let's make a definition attempt. So this is my attempt to define the thing that I'm interested in. I'm trying to define omega p. So I projectivize my 
domain. So my endomorphism space is it, just, I mean, it's just a finite dimensional vector space. I can projectivize it and I can map to this other projective variety. And what I do is I take a projective class of an endomorphism and I map it to P composed A and I take the projective class of that. I mean, that sounds, that sounds fair. Fortunately, it's not that simple because um, you're not allowed, like the projective class of zero does not exist. So let's look at a simple example. Let's say P is X1, X2, and I take the matrix A, which is just, which is the singular matrix and which maps one variable to zero. Well, because I'm mapping one variable to zero, I'm, the whole thing will become zero, but I, I can't, so the definition omega P, the, 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 it breaks down because I'm not allowed to look at square bracket zero. It doesn't exist. It's not a thing. You, there's no, there's not the one line through zero. So you don't get to have that in projective space. Um, uh, so yeah, the zero polynomial does not correspond to a point in the projective variety um, P omega bar P. But luckily, we are not the first ones to have this problem. Projective geometry has had this problem forever. And the brilliant solution to this is just, we, we just invent a new thing that, um, that, capture, that, that allows us to do this. So this is a thing. Uh, let X and, B, X and Y be varieties. X is irreducible for this definition. We have that, it's good. And a rational map from X to Y denoted by omega and then we just make the arrow like we, instead of a regular arrow, we just draw it dashed. This is a morphism. I mean, this is a, this is a bit of an informal definition, but I think it's, it's a good way to think about it. And it's not, it's not wrong. So it's a morphism, but it, we're allowed, it, it's allowed to be undefined on a closed set. So you can, essentially you can do what we just did, but you're not allowed to call it a morphism. You have to call it a rational map. That's the, that's the point. So uh, here's a simple example. One that like to maybe to think about. Um, let's say omega is going from P2 to P2, so projective space with three affine coordinates or and two dimensions. And we map X, Y, Z to this other projective point X, Y, Y, Z, Z, X. And this map is not defined at any of the points where two coordinates are zero, because when you when you set any two of the variables to zero, you would get zero. But, and I should have put a dashed arrow here. That is, uh, that is an oversight on my part. So, sorry, this should be a dashed arrow. Um, and there we go. Now we can define the rational orbit map. I mean, I know we haven't done anything yet. All we've done is move notation and terminology around to like to put this into a different frame of reference. We'll start doing things uh, in, a, in a minute here. Um, but we're allowed to say omega p from, the projective space of endomorphisms to the projectivized orbit closure is defined like this. That's fine. And we can, it's obvious where it is undefined. So the, the set where this is undefined is, we call it, I, I call it AP. This is, I call it the annihilator of P because it's the set of all projective classes of endomorphisms such that this endomorphism would annihilate the polynomial. So P composed with A equals zero. It is, um, Straightforward. I, I say it, it's straightforward to see that this is a closed set. Um, this here in the back is a set of polynomial equations, right? You think you have your polynomial P, which is a linear combination of monomials. You compose it with let's let's assume A is a matrix of indeterminates, and then what you get over here is a system of polynomial equations in the entries of A. And by requiring that this system of equations is equal to zero, um, you can see that this annihilator is actually a closed set inside, inside here. So this is it's a valid, well-defined rational map. And this is the one I want to, uh, to study. Um, obviously, so we haven't gained anything yet. Rational maps are not, rational maps don't have the same property as morphisms. Otherwise, this would be pure magic, right? They, they don't, they are not closed. They are not like, we, we don't get that omega P is surjective. That would be, that would be too simple. But there are techniques from projective geometry that we can use to sort of make it surjective or turn it into, or turn it into a morphism, I should rather say. Uh, so, okay, so I have a quick recap on the side here, just for reference, so we don't get lost. Um, we had this omega P check, which just maps A to P composed with A 
turned it into this uh, rational map, which is the one I want to study. And down here, this is where this map is not defined. And of course, all of these things are strongly related. Um, there is what, what you do as an algebraic geometer, if you have a rational map and you, and you want a morphism, um, you study the graph. And the graph is, I mean, it's probably the most complicated formula I have on these slides, but it's, it's just because of all the brackets. So it's what you think of when you think of graph. You just have all the points in your domain and the image of all these points. In this case, of course, I can only write this when A is a point where the map is defined. So I have to consider only points that are not, where A is not in the annihilator. And then you get like a graph. Just think like a function graph, like you would, like you would think of. Um, but then what we do is we take the closure. And this is where all the magic happens in this closure. There's like no actual way. And this is like all the magic is hidden in this one line. We have no good way of knowing what happens when we take this set inside this Cartesian product and take this closure. And it will be all about figuring out what, what is added in this closure. So just, I say this because when I first saw the definition of the graph, I, get, I got stuck at this closure. I was like, yeah, I understand what is down here, but what is in this closure? The, the, the truth is we don't know. This is the tricky part. But it's a closed set and it is inside this Cartesian product. So it gives us a few really cool things. It gives us two morphisms. Um, so this is a projective variety because it is closed inside a projective variety. And it has two morphisms which are induced by the projections to each of these Cartesian factors, right? You have gamma down here, you have your rational map omega up here. And you just, just because it is inside this Cartesian product, you have two maps. You can project to the one factor and you can project to the other. And now gamma P, this is what we want. This is the, we have, we have basically, so we have taken omega, we have done this, We've constructed this uh, convoluted object. I mean, it's not that convoluted. It's the graph, and then we take the closure. And this gamma P is now a morphism. It's a projective morphism from some variety that we don't quite understand onto the orbit closure. And this one, I want to understand. I want to, I want to use, I, I, I used to use omega as my lens to view the orbit closure, and I want to use this one. Of course, this is harder because I don't understand gamma as well as PE. And now, and, and this brings me to beta, because what, what do we do? We have to understand how this one is transformed into gamma by whatever beta does. And when we, and so the basic idea of how to understand this whole thing is basically understand how PE turns into gamma through beta, and then, um, Hopefully everything else falls into place. And in, in some cases it does. Okay, again, quick recap. We have this, uh, this rational map and we have this, uh, this resolution of, uh, we call it a resolution because uh, omega has indeterminacies and these maps do not. So we resolved the indeterminacies. Um, and beta is actually a thing that, like everything has a name in algebraic geometry. It doesn't mean we understand it, but we have a name for it. The morphism beta from gamma to PE is a so-called blow-up. And it has a, there's a good reason for why it's called a blow-up. What it essentially does is it takes tiny things or low-dimensional varieties in PE, and it blows them up, it makes them bigger um, in the result. So in, in gamma, the things are bigger than they were in... There's, there's no better way to explain it. Um, it is defined. So I now, okay, so before I do this, I have to get into scheme language here and I will, and the entire rest of this slide is about justifying why, because nobody wants to think about schemes. It's like, uh, but sometimes you have to because the, the situation is just what it is. So um, this morphism is defined by the ideal I that is generated by the equations P composed A equal to zero. Now, I mentioned before that you can think of this as a system of polynomial equations in the entries of the matrix A. And 
you can take all of these polynomials and stick them into one ideal. And then this ideal, this is what uniquely defines the way in which this blow up behaves. So I will note that when you take the, um, I think I defined AP projective. So I'm not sure if this P is necessary. Please, please ignore it. Yeah. Might, might not be necessary, this P. Anyway, uh, note that the annihilator is the set of all projective classes of matrices where P composed A is zero. So this is the zero set of I. That's clear. But unfortunately, I is not equal to its radical in general. So we can't say that the blow up is uniquely defined by this zero set. It is, it is actually defined by the equations. And these equations might like, you, you can use different equations to cut out the same variety, but you can, eh. I mean, this is about multiplicities. You could have like the, the this this ideal could have as a scheme or um, the, the scheme that it defines could have complicated multiplicities that are reflected in in the blow up, and that would not re be reflected in, in in this thing. I'm sorry, it's just the way it is. But the hope is, I mean, the hope would be that we don't have to deal with it. But in in general, this is the issue. So um, gamma is not defined by this variety, but is defined by the ideal I itself. That's the, that's the message. Sorry. And the ideal I then again is equivalent to a closed subscheme. And again, as you can see, I put a little hat here because um, I never want, like, I don't want to talk about the scheme, but it's, it's just the reality of it uh, for now. Maybe we get rid of it later. So uh, the ideal I is equivalent to a closed subscheme, and this is called the center of beta P. And beta P is uniquely defined by center. So we have a closed subscheme, sub which is essentially a way of attaching multiplicities and additional metadata to a subvariety, right? You can have a subvariety, which is just, you can think about it set theoretically. It's just a zero set of polynomials. And a subscheme is like you're attaching a little bit more metadata to this to this subset, and this now has all the information you need to define a blow up. Um, and the blow up then takes the center and blows it up and makes it bigger by through a well through essentially the construction that we just saw. So this this graph construction you can if you yeah that's essentially what it does. And now if this scheme is a variety then it's just this one, just as a remark. Um, yeah, this, this is my slide about uh, subschemes and blowing up yeah. and why we have to do it or why we want to do it. So at this point, I've done a lot of uh, theory and I want to quickly recap our proof strategy for, um, for proving this theorem that I presented earlier. So I said, uh, the boundary of the, the three by three determined polynomial is a union of two orbit closures. So I want to present the strategy for proving this just so you know why we're doing this and where we are. First, this is the easy part. I'm not doing this in the talk. So you identify the two components and, uh, and you prove that both of them are orbit closures. There are different techniques uh, that or, well, not entirely different. What you do to do that is related, but um, I, I won't have time to explain how you find them. But actually, but finding them is a little bit easier than proving that they are the only ones. So assume you already know two components, and you know that, uh, and you know that this uh, that this boundary consists of two or contains two hypersurfaces, which are orbit closures. Then, as I already said, we want to study this rational map which is just, yeah, just defined in this very intuitive way, but unfortunately it's not defined everywhere. Next, understand the geometry of this scheme, which is all the points, which is basically a more, a more, refined, uh, a more refined piece of data capturing the points where omega is not defined. So this like captures the indeterminacy of, of omega. Now, after if once we understood the geometry of this, which is probably the most difficult part, 
Um, from this, we can deduce the changes. Well, this is also like both of these parts are fairly difficult. So we understand the geometry of uh, the indeterminacies. And then from these, we deduce or we, we conclude what kind of changes are introduced by this blow up. So the idea is if we understand the center very well and we are, well, it's not quite that easy, but yeah, there's still work to do, but the, the, the next step is to, is to then understand how gamma differs from PE. And now the, the, the basic, now we can get to the, to the end of the proof almost. Um, every, a blow up is something that introduces new hypersurfaces. That is what is meant by blowing up. So when you, when you do this graph construction and you take the closure, you get additional hypersurfaces that you might not have had before. So inside PE, you have these indeterminacies and they are typically of low dimension. And the blow up construction turns these into hypersurfaces, turns these into the highest dimensional um, sub variety that you can get. And the introduction of new hyper, like, and okay, so each new hypersurface that is introduced basically allows you to cover one more hypersurface in the image. In the image, we, we have this, we, we have the orbit closure and the boundary of the orbit closure is a hypersurface in there. This, oh, sorry. This boundary has a bunch of components. And when we started, we couldn't hit them all. We didn't, we didn't, we, we didn't have enough data in our, like, I will move, I will quickly move to, to this because this is easier to understand. So over here, inside the orbit closure, there's a subset, which is the boundary. That's what we're interested in. The boundary, think of it as having, you know, seven components. It's a thing that has seven components. When we start with this construction, what are the things we can hit? We can hit the orbit itself, which has nothing to do with the boundary. And we have one hypersurface in, in PE over here. We have the set of singular matrices. That is one hypersurface we have over here, which we have in like, th that's one we have. And we can use that one hypersurface to, to, get a, to get one hypersurface over here. But there's six more. And these, these six others, we, we just can't get them. Now, beta, introduces new hypersurfaces. Like maybe you can think of beta as like an iterative process and there's like a few steps, each of which adds a hypersurface. And whenever we gain a new hypersurface over here, then this, then this give, gives gamma P the power to cover one more hypersurface in the image. Like it, it, it gives it one more thing that it would even be able to map to something. And this is how you arrive at an upper bound because you know that eventually gamma P is able to cover everything. So we have to have been giving it enough new hypersurfaces to do that. And that's where the bound comes from. So right in the beginning, we only had one and this beta is adding new ones. And we know in the end we have enough. So now that that's where um, the, the, uh, that's where this is derived from. If we do this cleverly. Yes, yeah. could I ask you a question? Yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. So, okay. So this is when you are viewing it through also the lens of uh, algebraic geometry. Yes. Now, if you were to change your focus and try something different, I mean, if you were to do the same process through differential geometry, is there a hope that you would be able to understand what this decentralization process is? Uh, I mean, or is it equivalent and uh... I will, I will, okay so um i will say there's absolutely a chance blow up is not something that is limited as a concept to algebra or algebraic geometry this is a mm. uh, as a okay. as a geometric concept it is known across all geometric disciplines so and um in general differential geometry when you can apply it usually has it usually has something to offer even though I, I, I'm not good at it, but it usually has something to offer. Like if I knew how to exploit this or how to do it efficiently, I would tell you, but I don't. However, I will say that I, it's, it's, it's something that I would say is worth looking into. 
Cool. Because the, the geometric construction itself, you can you can make the entire like you can reproduce the entire thing analytically. Yeah, exactly. That's and do awesome. yeah, and, and study all the same objects. You can study the same yeah. objects in the in the same diagram with the same apps. You yeah. can study all of them analytically, and yeah, that would absolutely be that would be really nice actually if that would yield better insight into into what happens because yeah, what happens can be expressed in in, in both of these worlds. Yeah, because here it, I mean, it is sort of post facto. You see, you are seeing yes. it, and then you know that okay, this is all happening. Yeah, that's the yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, hey, ask questions, right? I'm, I I haven't I have enough time. I will not. I just yeah. So I, I wanted to present the plan first. So you are you are deeply motivated to think about blow ups and um and indeterminacies of rational maps, because while preparing this talk. I actually, I said, I need an example for this whole weird blow up stuff because it's like, it's so theoretical and not like you don't have, you have nothing in your mind right now because this is so abstract. And I went through an example, which I should probably have done during my PhD. And I realized that things might be better than I thought they were. So I want to present this example to you and show you why um, it made me very optimistic. And so, you know what the strategy is, and I want to talk again. I want to talk briefly about blowups. We do uh, we do one example for a blowup map, which is disconnected from this proof, but just so that we understand what this is and have like have something have something to hold on to in terms of uh, example. So the rational map that I use this is obviously not, so again this is not a rational map that uh, comes from precomposition of polynomials it's just it's just an arbitrary rational map but when you do the whole polynomial and orbit closure thing the dimensions go absolutely haywire and I needed an example that is where dimensions are manageable so the rational map is uh, going from p2 into the set of all uh, so this should this should be the projectivization of this set. Uh, again, I for, there should be a p in front of this. Oh well, I mean, I used square brackets. Maybe that's well. <laughs> so the set of um, projective classes of matrices that have determinant zero essentially. So t1, t4 uh, is t, t2, t3. So t1, t4 minus t2, t3 would be zero. And the map is defined by mapping x, y, z to this uh, projective classes of, of a matrix. So first coordinate is x times x, second is x times y, this is x times z, this is y times z. It's very similar to an example we saw before. But um, So this map is not defined at two points. Um, namely, if you set x and y to zero, everything vanishes. And also if you set x and z to zero, everything vanishes. And I claim so, and from this it follow, or maybe it's a different observation altogether. Um, this line L1, which consists of all these classes of matrices, so it's 0, 0, ST, where ST comes from a projective line. This is not in the image of omega. We can't we can't get we, we can't get those those points. Because if uh, if these two are zero, so if x times x is zero and x times y is zero then um, let's see, then X has to be zero. And if X is zero, then X times Z has to be zero. And so we can't get every S or we, like we, can, we can get only really one point in here, which is T equals to one. So we can't get the entire thing. Now let's uh, look at a line through a one in like in a certain direction. Uh, so this is epsilon s, epsilon t, colon one. If I let epsilon go to zero, it will it will approach a one. So this is, it's it's a line through a one in and I say in the direction s t because well that's like, that's I mean I hope it makes sense. Um, when I take this this point, like I, I, I leave epsilon as a parameter and I map it, I, I stick it, I stick this into omega. I get this matrix. Uh, I did this by hand. Uh, so uh, let's see, x times x, epsilon squared s squared, yes. Epsilon squared st, yes. 
uh, x times z is epsilon s times one, yes. Y times z is epsilon t times one is this. Wonderful. We are in projective space, so I can cancel the epsilon, right? I, I'm allowed to cancel the epsilon away because it's at least once in each coordinate. So this is the same as the projective class of epsilon s squared, epsilon st, st. And now I just let epsilon go to zero. Then up here, everything vanishes, and I end up at this point. So if I trace the image of omega along this line, so right in my, in my, in my domain, I go along this line PST, this line PST, and I map it over here into my image and I trace the image, then eventually I arrive at this point. So every single point from L1 is actually in the closure of the image. And this of course means that L1 is in the closure of the image. So I can't get the entire line, but it like, but I can't, but it matters. So the, the nature of the approximation matters. Somehow it was important, it was important how I was moving towards the indeterminacy. Right? It, was, it was important that I was approaching A1 in, in my domain along the line in this direction. And this direction defined at which point in the image I ended up. And you can, you can play the same game, by the way, for L2, which is just the transpose of L1, and then you switch Y and Z. So it's, it's very symmetric. So we can, we can restrict to L1. This, is, uh, this already tells you everything you need to know about this example. Now, um, before, before I do this. Um, again, I have a question here again. Oh, yes. So here, okay, so you are, okay, so you are approaching this uh, whatever this this limit point is certainly a co-dimension one inside your closure inside whatever you're looking at which is uh, the line t1 t4, mean... t1 t4 minus t2 t3 equal to zero and uh, now yes. you have two coordinates here and uh, therefore it has dimension two and so that had dimension three and so this is really a co-dimension one object mm -hmm. in that Correct? um and, let's see so uh, how is I'm 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 going to say it's a P one. So would I? I didn't think about it too much. Uh, it's yeah, but still, there are two factors, right? I mean, there are two two things that you have S and T. So they're both yeah, but way. yeah, but it's a P one. So it's it's projective. So you can always scale. So this is so this thing should have just one. It's oh, it's, okay. a, it's a it's a one oh, dimensional it's object. Okay, it's a one. Oh, sorry. Okay. But let's uh, and it, but, but I think this makes it's still code I mentioned one I think because so we have four over here we lose one, one from one. projective space and one from the one equation more. okay okay so, so we okay. have we're left with two dimensions right it's it's a surface and this line is a code this I mentioned line. one okay 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 no the reason I'm asking is look somehow uh, yeah so this is again related to what you will present soon uh, I mean if you were to just get a point say in the closure, it is much easier to decide what it appears, at least to me, that it will be much easier to decide which direction you should take to get to a point. Because almost, uh, though, I mean, reaching this should actually be, in some sense, uh, I mean, you have to be far more clever to reach this than to reach something which is of much smaller code dimension, it appears. Is that true or uh, is that? Uh, so so that, like this is a, it's almost a philosophical question. Um, so, okay, um, I will, I, again, sadly, I will probably have to say, I don't know. So um, finding these things and like, okay, uh -huh. or, or rather finding a path. Okay, this is a very simple example. Everything is super linear. Like the curve I took mm. to approach the point is a line. In general, I do not know how to construct the curve that is needed to approach a certain point in the image, or rather, and, and it, it's much worse. In general, I don't even know all the points that can be approximated, but they are in one-to-one -one correspondence. For each point in the closure, there is some path that approaches Got it. Hmm. But I am, um, I, I do not, and there's a there's a whole slew of questions, and I hope I wrote them all down in the thesis. There's a whole bunch of questions related to what is necessary in terms of approximating paths 
So in this case, we used a line. Do we have to, like, are there cases where we have to use more complicated curves, higher degree curves? Probably yes, but are these, is the degree of these curves somehow restricted by other properties of the variety or of the map? Also, probably yes, but I don't know in which way. And um, so, sadly, I know very little about how to go, like, to, how to find approximating paths uh, from, from, yeah, that, that, that lead you to points in the closure. And unfortunately for me, it, none of this is easy. I, like, it's, neither is it easy to find something of low code dimension, nor is it easy to find something of high code dimension, at least for me. I, I find both of these things very hard. Uh, but I'm glad you like. I'm glad you brought this up because I should mention that this, of course, is the way by which you find these components in the orbit closure. Right? You pick paths and you do an approximation, and you see whether you end up at something that is worth looking at. Uh, okay, but uh, I haven't gotten to Thanks. the good part yet because <laughs> because there's a really there's something really nice about this for me. Um, First, I want to say, so this is, this will end up being a, like, we will end up understanding the blow up really well. So each of these two points is an indeterminacy and they both get blown up two lines. And these two lines then cover the two image lines. And I was looking at this and I realized, okay, so the, the ideal that defines this blow up is of course, just the entries of how we define the map. It's um, X squared, XY, XZ, YZ. That's that's the ideal that defines the blow up because it is the equations that define the rational map. Now, the saturation of this ideal, luckily for us, is just this. It's X and YZ. You can check that this is the saturation. And this is a radical ideal. So this is just the, it's the, it, it is the ideal of the two element set A1, A2. And uh, because of this, uh, I had a little reference here, uh, the center of this blow up is actually a variety. It's A1, A2. And this is, the, this is the positive discovery that I made because before I had not been thinking about saturations. And the fact that saturations in projective, like in, in projective geometry, it's not required that the ideal is equal to its radical for it to define a, a subvariety, only its, satur like it, its saturation has to be radical. And I, I, I'll be honest, I, I didn't think about this before. I was thinking just in terms of, I, I was thinking still too affine. I was thinking just in terms of ideals and their radicals, but I wrote this entire example down and I arrived here and I was like, no, it can't, like, it can't be. This blow up can't, like the center, like, just geometrically speaking, the center can only be this variety. There can't be more multiplicity. It makes no sense. And so, uh, and then when it hit me, so, right. We have to go to the saturation. And okay, so what is my hope? My hope is that maybe this applies to the larger whole of the, like of the GCT issue as well. And this is actually something that Peter Bugesa, my, my advisor said all the time. He said like, no, I can't imagine that there are like, complicated and weird multiplicities in many of these. And I was like, maybe, but I, I have no, yeah, this is what I should have done. Uh, I have this at the end in my reading recommendations as well. This uh, lecture notes by Andreas Gartmann are a fantastic reference if you want to get into uh, algebraic geometry and uh, it's in there as well. All right. And uh, finally, I'll say again what I said before, this blow up just replaces each of these two points by a copy of P1. And then suddenly after resolving the indeterminacies, like the resolved, we can do with this thing the same we did with the other, you get a blow up, you get a, a gamma, and this gamma will, like, these two points will be blown up to things inside the blow up, and they can then be mapped to the lines. And this is like, essentially, this is a nice little toy example that represents everything we do in the GCT world as well. And my main point, I, th I said it three times, but my main point is maybe, maybe it's all a little nicer than I thought because of saturations. All right. Um, now let's talk about uh, smooth blowups because that's the real kicker. 
Let us assume for a second, just let's just assume for a second that this blow up that we studied or that we want to study can be written as a sequence of like smaller, smaller blow ups. Like it, you start at your uh, endomorphism space and you blow up once and you blow up twice, you blow up like every time you find something tiny in there and you somehow make it bigger. I'm, I'm super sorry that I can't give you a better formal, like the, the, the disconnect between the idea of a blow up and the, and the formal definition. Well, it's, I mean, I think it's pretty big. There's a, there's a big gap between like having the idea, okay, I have something tiny in here and I want to make it bigger somehow. And then this definition that there's varying equivalent definitions for how the blow up works. There's some, some is extremely algebraic with uh, it's the proj of a graded ring or something. Some are more geometric. Like what I showed you is the it's the closure of a graph of a rational map. That's also a definition for the blow up, but putting these together as with many things in mathematics, I think I, I can't, I, I have no, picture that I can present to you that makes it click right away. But as with many things in mathematics, you get used to them over time. So somehow your mind, um, your mind accepts that this, that the formal definition is actually doing what you want it to do. Namely, it takes a small sub variety and it blows it up. It makes it bigger into a, a hypersurface. And if it seems daunting, I can. I'll, I just want to take a moment and promise you, it gets better when you deal with it for a bit, as with many things in math. So, okay. Now, back to the topic. Let's assume we have like a sequence of blowups, and as I said, if if the if the theory is is seeming too abstract, let's think of it algorithmically. It's just you have something tiny, something low dimensional in here. And each step in this algorithm gives you a new hypersurface. And we know that at the end, we, we wanna have enough hypersurfaces to cover all the hypersurfaces that make up the boundary. Okay, and I have been, what I omitted is that um, I want to assume that in this sequence of blowups, um, the center is always a smooth variety, and that is what is otherwise known as it's a is a smooth blow up. So I'm um, I'm assuming that I can write this entire blow up as a sequence of blow ups, where in each step I take a smooth sub variety, which is of high co dimension, and that one I blow up. Then I claim, and this is basically like the, this is the core proposition that we need to finish the proof. Then I claim that the boundary has at most K plus one components. So um, here's the proof sketch. Um, if you have a blow up with a smooth center, then it creates only one new hypersurface. That's a fact from algebraic geometry. Um, so has a lengthy proof, I can't present it here, or I mean, or, or, it's either a lengthy proof or a proof that requires a bunch of prerequisites, which is, which is sort of equivalent. Um, but this is the core observation, of course, if you, because then if gamma P is like, since gamma P is surjective, we know that K new hypersurfaces, I mean, we had the one, right? The one we always have, the singular matrices, that's the one we always have. But we know that K new hypersurfaces were enough to completely cover gamma um, to, to cover the boundary. And if we know that K additional hypersurfaces were enough to cover all of it, then clearly there can be at most K plus one components in this boundary because, uh, because K plus one things are enough to cover it. So uh, how do you say in English? A pigeonhole, essentially, just. Um, now we know what we wanna do. We want to prove for like in certain specific cases, we want to show that you can like for the determinant for the three by three determinant, we want to show that the blow up is just a single smooth blow up. That's what we want to prove for the three by three determinant case because that would give us two. And we will and we'll be able to do that. Uh, but in other cases, I, I'm pretty sure uh, it will be required to, um, to understand like the actual sequencing of this blow up in greater detail. Um, so over the complex numbers, but I, I should also mention that over the complex numbers, uh, this is always possible. You can factor your blow up into a sequence of smooth ones. So um, this is not completely, um, 
is that completely irrational to think about these things? Um, but for the yeah, but for the but we will like the example we'll be looking at is uh, much more simple because um, we will find out that well the blow up is just one single smooth blow up which will give us two. We know there's two components. We're done. All right. So we've covered introduction annotation, and as I said, I'll I talk a lot about the rational orbit map. And now you probably have no idea why I want to talk about something called maximal linear subspaces, but I will explain. This is what we need to better understand this blow up. So I call it dissecting the indeterminacy of the rational orbit map. We have a polynomial and to understand the blow up from gamma to like this, uh, this, should, this should be P and Man, I have a lot of typos in here. So ignore this. This should this this goes to the endomorphism set. Um, but to understand the blow up, we have to understand its center because that is what uniquely defines it. And I know I said before the center is actually the scheme, and this is the variety. But let's look at the variety for a bit. It will help us understand uh, the actual thing. Uh, the annihilator is defined as the set of uh, endomorphisms that annihilate p, so where p composed with a zero. But a different way to look at this is by saying, okay, so these are all the endomorphisms where the image of a is a full subset of the zero set of p. So we're actually looking for, or we're looking at um, endomorphisms uh, whose image is a linear subspace of the vanishing set of p. So maybe more comfortable geometric way of looking at it. And um, this is what the definition will be like. So first of all, I, this is like a, like a helper definition. I wanna define end, the, the endomorphisms of omega comma L. This is supposed to be all endomorphisms of uh, W whose image is contained within L. This is not quite the same as homomorphisms from uh, W to L, so this is why the notation is slightly different, but it's similar in nature. Then I define this fancy LP bar. And again, whenever I have something on top of a symbol, it's not, it's not really what I want to look at, but I need it. Um, these are all uh, subsets of the zero set of P that are linear subspaces. Now, and LP, this is the one I really want to look at. This is, these are the inclusion-wise maximal elements of this set. And with these definitions, we can we have a nice way of writing the annihilator. It's the set of all endomorphisms A, where the image of A is just an element of LP bar, right? It is some linear space that is contained within the zero set of the polynomial. But of course, um, I can write this as a union over just the inclusion-wise maximal elements, because if you are if you are an element of um, if you're if you're if you map into a sub into a subspace of an inclusion wise maximal one, then you are also contained in end W L for the inclusion wise maximal L. And so we have like a decom this gives us a decomposition of uh, this annihilator into objects that are actually not that horrible to look at. These are just spaces of and like space linear spaces of endomorphisms fairly. Fairly straightforward. True, of, of course, AP is not quite what we're interested in because there's the whole scheme thing going on, but we're getting there. Um, and I wanna make an example. So um, look at the vanishing linear spaces for the three by three determinant. It's these. You can have zeros in the bottom row, zero, I mean, up to permutation and things that leave determinants invariant. These are the only ones up to, up to invariant transformations. Zeros down here, zeros down there, uh, vanishing minor and uh, skew symmetric matrices, which are the more interesting ones. Now, because of this, these are like, okay, so this, we're lucky. Um, for the three by three determinant, all these spaces had, or, or I was lucky, I should rather say, all of these spaces had been classified already. So this is how I could, without actually doing any more work, write down the decomposition of AP as these four components, essentially. Now, good news. 
this is what will be this, this will be important. We will be able to ignore all but L4 to understand dead three. So only one will be left. This will be pure magic. Well, no, it's not pure magic, but uh, these are good news. Uh, the bad news are um, when D is greater or equal than five, then uh, this uh, the set of inclusion-wise maximal linear subspaces of the vanishing set of the D by D determinant is no longer finite and is also not entirely understood. And um, there's a lot of study required to do that. And, but I mean, maybe this is not quite as bad as I thought, because if you don't want to study the determinant, but if you want to study other polynomials, then uh, maybe they're easier, maybe they're harder. I don't know. But understanding these linear subspaces is really important to understand the annihilator, which is really important to understanding the blow up, which is really important to get upper bounds. Uh, yes. Now we'll go through this. We'll go through this. <laughs> uh, these were all the linear spaces. We, I, I want to explain why we can restrict to L4, or at least I want to motivate it. I'm not sure I can go through the entire proof, but I want to motivate why, why L4 is the only one we care about. Um, and this has to do with a concept called semi-stability or just stability. And I will make one example and then tell you that, that all that L2 and L3 work the same way. So look at L1 and take like a generic element from this space. So L1 is up here and this is like a generic element from L1. And I multiply it by this matrix from the left. So I have epsilon, epsilon, epsilon to the minus two. Important, the important bit about this matrix is that it has determinant one. So I'm multiplying everything from the left by something that has determinant one. So this is also something that would leave the determined polynomial if I were to precompose stuff with it would leave it invariant. It would do nothing to the it would do nothing to the determinant, but it does everything to this space, because um, of course the epsilon to the minus two doesn't do anything to the bottom row, and then I only end up with epsilons in the upper two rows, which slowly move this point towards zero. Now, let's ignore the bullet points for a moment and just read the sentence. Because T epsilon, which is this diagonal matrix, satisfies the following conditions, um, we can, and I, I didn't complete the sentence apparently, we, it, because it, because it uh, satisfies the following conditions, we, are, we can ignore L1. Now, let's talk about the conditions. As I said, I can't go into full detail, but I'll try to motivate it. GP is my notation for what is called the stabilizer of P. So it's just the, the linear transformations that leave P invariant. If you compose it with G, it remains P. Um, now, the determinant of T epsilon, as I mentioned before, is one. So if you have the, the determinant of T epsilon X, it's just the same as the determinant of X. Nothing has changed. So then we can, def like from this matrix, we can define a map, which is then a linear transformation on the space of matrices. I said before that this might be confusing, but so we can now define small t epsilon, which just maps a matrix X to t epsilon X. And this map is in the stabilizer, because if I apply this, like if I pre-compose the determinant with t epsilon, nothing changes. What you see up here is just a pre-composition with t epsilon, right? This is determinant pre-composed with t epsilon. Now, if you have something like this, a map in the stabilizer that is able to move this, in, like this is able to contract this entire thing down to zero. Maybe it's, maybe there's already some intuition in this image that tells you then there's no interesting information in it, right? So th this is like a space of matrices that has the potential to give you a component in the image but because it is unstable, it doesn't. Because up, like, up to the stabilizer, this point does not contain any useful information because the stabilizer is already able to contract it all down to zero. It, it's, it just doesn't hold the information potential to give you anything useful in the image. I mean, I'm, I'm speaking figuratively just to give you, this is not the formal definition, but uh, I'm hoping it, it conveys the, the reason, like the deeper, the deeper reason. And uh, similar maps exist for L2 and L3. You can, they're easy to write down actually, uh, but none exists for L4. And you can also prove that none exists for L4. So L4 does not contract down in, in such a way. 
um, here's the definition and I will have like, I will go briefly through the application. I'm, I'm sorry, I won't have the time to give like full blown proofs, but uh, yeah, let, let's look at it briefly. Um, so GP, as I said before, is the job, is the stabilizer. It's the set of all uh, invertible transformations that leave P invariant. And then there's something called the null cone of GP, of GP acting on the endomorphism space. That is literally just uh, the things that like, things like T epsilon, it is uh, maps in the endomorphism space such that zero is in the orbit closure of GP composed with A. Now, if, it's, if this is too abstract, um, let's see. Um, so T epsilon is, um, is my element, is, is a family of elements in GP. And I had um, some, some A in my L1 space. And I was able to move towards zero by applying elements from GP to this, to this element in the uh, L1 space down to zero. So that means that every point in every A in L1 was unstable, right? So A, A in this case is this thing, is the X1, X2, X3. This is, this is my A. And in GP, you have all these for each epsilon. For every epsilon, you have one in GP. So if you take all of them, you apply all of them to, to, to this thing, eventually you end up at zero. So this is why zero is in the closure of this set. And these points are called unstable. And what you do is you just remove them. You just, you just take them out because, because they're not good. Um, and the reason why they're not good is, it, or the reason why we can't ignore them will be down here. But unfortunately, I won't be able to go into detail, but I will motivate it. So we remove them and we call the resulting set ESS for semi-stable. And uh, PESS is just defined as the projectivization of ESS. Now, remember how I was going on about how great projective space is? Um, well, if you just remove something from it, it's no longer projective. So generally, you can't just cut something out and say, oh, I'm going to ignore it, and I'll keep all the nice properties of my projective map. You can't in general, because, um, yeah, because this is no longer a projective variety. However, we are lucky, or I mean, it's the nature of the problem. We are allowed to replace this projective space by the semi-stable points. And the reason for this is the following. There's a quotient map that goes from the set of semi-stable points to, well, to a quotient, which is a geometric quotient. And, or I'm, I'm not sure if that is formally correct. Maybe it's just a good quotient. There are, there are varying degrees of qualities in, uh, in GIT quotients, but it's certainly a projective variety and that's the kicker. So we can go from here to this quotient and the result is a projective variety and luckily, going to this quotient is basically something we can do for free because the rational map that goes from this, uh, that we're interested in, the rational orbit map, is GP invariant because we're mapping maps to precomposing with P. So of course, if you then act like, yeah, if you, if you map something, uh, if you precompose a map with something from the stabilizer, it doesn't change the outcome. So you're allowed to go through this projective quotient. And this is the entire reason why you can replace PE by PESS. And going through the motions of this is slightly technical. So that's why I don't wanna do it on screen, but it's in my thesis. And, uh, and if you have questions, you can reach out. But I wanted to present the reason why we can do it. Okay, and now, um, now I'll, I'll finish the proof now. Essentially, I have two minutes left, according to my clock. We have the stabilizer. All right, don't look at the left side. I think it was a bad idea to, to design it this way. This is our situation. We have this rational map, omega p. We go from the space of uh, all endomorphisms into the projective orbit closure. And we have resolved the indeterminacies. And now, because of what I said on the previous slide, we're allowed to do it in this shadow realm, in this in this, in this world where we use um, semi-stable points. This is probably the only case where the tiny bar on top of the symbol, I, I really want to use these. So these are not, I, I don't hate the bar here. These are some, these are good guys. I want to use them. Um, 
And if you operate in this world, then everything is good. Because in this world, um, like if you restrict your annihilator to semi-stable points, it becomes a smooth variety. You end up with just, essentially just end up with this, right? You end up with just uh, endomorphisms from omega to L4. I'm omitting a few technical details, but it becomes straightforward. It becomes a computation to prove that what remains is a smooth variety. You can, it's, a, it's, it's actually an, an orbit itself under a completely different action. It's a very, it's a homogeneous space. So you can pick a single point, prove by a compute, by, by an actual computation. You just compute a tangent space and you compute dimensions. You compute that it's non-singular at a single point. And then by a homogeneity, like by, by virtue of being a homogeneous space itself, you can then argue that the entire thing is smooth and you end up with the nice situation that the center of this beta P bar, so the center of this thing is actually a smooth variety. This is why, and yeah, and then you're done. <laughs> this, this finishes the proposition and proves that the boundary has at most two irreducible components. According to my clock, I spent exactly 75 minutes. So um, I have just, I mean, I will, I will include strategy and reading suggestions in the Q&A. And I included reading suggestions that I don't think are, I mean, there's a ton of great books that everybody recommends about algebraic geometry and these things, but there's a few that are not quite as widely known. And that's why I want to list them here. So this is not, this is maybe not the greatest books in algebraic geometry, but they are, they, they are, I, I, rec I can wholeheartedly recommend all of them. So one is, uh, Lecture notes by Andreas Gatman from 2003. It's a it's a hyperlink. I can I can eventually share these slides. Um, these are fantastic. This is a German book by Hans Peter Kraft. If you can read German, it's the it's probably the best book I know about invariant theory. But th there's there's something similar in English, geometric methods, and, but it's not quite as complete as the German version. And then there's two books that I really love. Um, Lee algebras and algebraic groups is like it's a it's a very Bourbaki style approach to the whole algebraic groups thing. Um, if you're, I don't know, I'm also a computer scientist at heart. I, I know many I know many geometers who think that this book reads kind of kind of cool and stale and heartless, but I I loved it. I think it's like it it's very rigorous. It does everything like in order, and I, I liked it very much. And uh, <clears throat> Finally, there, I just wanted to mention it because uh, I don't think it's mentioned uh, that often. There's a great book by Hamdex and Gail Kemper, Computational Invariant Theory, which also, which also goes into uh, many of, much of this stuff. Um, and also there's my dissertation. And um, if you, if it's, if this is all terrible and you feel down, then I recommend The Life and Times of Scrooge McDuck by Don Rosen. It's the best comic that was ever written. Okay, questions. 